Yeah. All you need is a B in the final. Huh? All you need is a B in the final. I know. <laughs> Not very difficult. I know, but... You need one? Thanks. And actually, I did register for Spectrum Service on my 18th birthday exactly. <laughs> Not that it matters anymore. Go ahead. I threw the card away years ago. Thank you. So, number one, we are told that the AN and CN converge. Does BN necessarily converge? Well, of course, the answer is no. We may have, uh, we, we may have, uh, something like this, for instance where this is our AN, which converges to minus one. Our, so how did we call this guy? CN converges to one, and this does not converge. Okay, in order to use a squeezing principle, of course, you need to have that both sequences converge to the same limit. Okay. Just an illustration that you need to be careful with your hypothesis and you need to make sure you, you know what the hypothesis of every uh, result is before applying it. Okay, number two. So our starting point is x less than minus two. And then we would square this. And because it's, these are negative number, x squared is a decreasing function. Always ask yourself, okay? Am I sure I know how this uh, function behaves? Now, uh, we want minus x squared less than minus four. Then one minus x squared is less than minus three. So here we should say that uh, the function x squared is decreasing on the negative. And here we are going to take inverses and remember that the inverse function is decreasing on the negative and on the positive as well. So we would again reverse this. And then we multiply by x, by, but x we know is a negative number, it's less than minus two. So when we mul multiply across by x, we get this. So our c is minus one third. Okay, for number three, we say that for every epsilon, there exists an N. If N is bigger than capital N, then AN one to the power one over N converges to two, so we would say minus two is less than epsilon. This gives us a double inequality. And because we want bigger than three half, we it's enough to take epsilon equal one half. And then we get that this is uh, equal to three half. So we get that a n to the one over n is bigger than three half for all n bigger than capital N. Now this gives me a n bigger than three half to the n. So how do I justify this step? How do I know that a n must be bigger than three half to the n, given that we have this? A n is square root of zero, so uh, extra n x x to the n is increasing on the positive numbers.
So we have this. Now we we had the. Uh, does someone need a review sheet? No. Uh, now we uh, we had the large inequality, not a strict one, but if a n is bigger than three half to the n then it is also bigger than or equal to 3 half to the n. So that's not a problem. Okay? This is a set which is larger than this one. So you can relax the inequality. The other way around is wrong, of course. Okay? If, uh, if you may be equal, then maybe you're not strictly bigger. So that's okay. Take a y not in B and note that x is less than y not for all x in A. That's part of a hypothesis. So y not is an upper bound of A. And we are also told that A is not empty. So we may use the fundamental property of the reals and get that A has a least upper bound. Uh, let's call it capital M A. Then, uh, for B, we do the same thing. We, we let x not be something in A. And then we have that x not is less than y for all y in B. And then uh, we can say that uh, x not is a lower bound. And B is not empty, so B has a greatest lower bound that we denote by MB. Okay, so twice we are applying the fundamental property of the rails. Now B are the least upper bound and greatest lower bound defined in A necessarily equal. The answer is no, and that's because we may have for A, we may take 0, 1, and for B, we may take two, three. Okay, so we may have a gap between A and B. Okay. In order to have equality, we need these two sets to be adjacent. adjacent. They, are not, they are not necessary. The next condition will make them adjacent. So in this case, the greatest, the, the capital MA is 1, and the lowercase mb is 2. Therefore, they are not equal. Now for C, so for C this counterexample doesn't work anymore because now I'm asking, I'm saying, well, for any epsilon, I want to be able to find a y and an x so that y minus x is less than epsilon. You see that with this example, I cannot get uh, closer than one between two elements, one in A, one in B. So if I take epsilon equal half, my property fails. 
So that's uh, not a count. I mean, the counter exam doesn't work anymore. And now we, we do have that the two are equal. And uh, the way we do that is simply by saying that um, x is so, yeah, okay. So now take any epsilon positive. And then y minus x, uh, so now we know that there are y in b and x in a, so that y minus x is positive. That's because our first assumption that all the elements of b are bigger than all the elements in a. So we know that this difference is always positive or zero. And this is less than epsilon, because this is the additional hypothesis we are given. Now, what we do also is we say that okay. uh, we say that y is always bigger than mb because mb is a lower bound, and x is always smaller than capital MA. So y minus x is bigger than mb minus MA. And y minus x, as written here, is less than epsilon. So mb minus ma is less than epsilon for every epsilon. So what's my conclusion at this point? Can I conclude that uh, mb and ma are the same thing? No, I cannot. I cannot uh, because epsilon can be as small as you want, uh, but I don't know whether this is a positive number. If I can squeeze it between epsilon and zero, then I'll be done. But if not, the only thing, the only conclusion I can get from this is that mb minus ma must be negative or zero. It could be strictly negative at this point. It cannot be strictly positive. If it were strictly positive, uh, it wouldn't work because I could take an epsilon small enough so that it's smaller than. So that wouldn't work. But it could be a negative number. It's not, of course, but we need to prove it. OK, so maybe here we should. Uh, I should be so let let me prove this last assertion there okay so one of the ways to do that is to take epsilon equal to 1 over n this is a legitimate epsilon since uh, it's a strictly positive number that's all I need so I know that mb minus ma is less than 1 over n for every n Okay, so this goes to mb minus ma, and this goes to a large inequality, and this goes to zero. So that's how I would get that it's a negative number, or zero. Right? Okay, because you can pick any epsilon you want, you do it for something going to zero. And then you pass to the limit, and you're done. Okay. So now that we have this, uh, we can, uh, yeah, let's, let's prove that this is actually also a positive number by uh, doing the following. Uh, okay, yeah, we can, we can uh, say the following that uh, um, since x so take, take x in A, y in B. Since x is less than y for all x and, and uh, y, I know that x is a lower bound of B. Okay, for any x, I know that x is a lower bound of B. But if x is a lower bound of B, it must be smaller than the greatest lower bound of B, which is MB. 
right? If it's lower bound, it's less than the greatest lower bound. So we need we have that x is less than mb. For every x in a, we can do this reasoning. Okay, we can do this reasoning for every x in a. So this tells me that mb is uh, an upper bound of a. Now, if it's an upper bound of a, it must be less than or no bigger than the least upper bound of of a, which we call them a. So we get that MB, minus, MB is larger than or equal to MA, <coughs> which gives us that MB minus MA is a positive number. So it's a positive number, and it's also a negative number, which tells me that MB must be MA. Questions? Yeah. Why did you show that it was positive so that you can squeeze it between 0 and 2 and show that it equals 0? Oh, the reason, okay, uh, so at this point I cannot, I, uh, my conclusion should be mb equal mb. Now why I cannot uh, uh, finish the problem here, it's because I don't have a lower bound at this point. You see, if I knew that the, I had a zero here at this point, then I would simply say, well, mb minus ma is zero, because it's always squeezed between zero and epsilon, and epsilon can be taken as small as I want. But because I don't have this, I need to prove it. So that's what I did there. Just show that right part there. Oh. And then do that. This part here? No, the right side. This? It was positive. Yes, so then I show it's positive, because if it's positive, then <laughs> I'm in business, you see, because I have my lower bound here. I'm not sure I understand your question. Why didn't you just do that and then go back to there and just say it's a squeeze between zero and epsilon? Oh, you could do that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Okay, number five. So you know that your function is differentiable on some interval, except possibly at one point. And that's typical of these piecewise functions. You know, uh, your g is, uh, g of x is minus x squared for negative x and positive x squared for positive, for, uh, you know, you, you, a typical g would be g of x is minus x squared for x negative and uh, x squared for x positive. So you know that you may have troubles at zero, but uh, you certainly outside zero there are no problems because outside it's locally a polynomial. Okay, so that's typically what the situation is. And instead of going back to the definition of uh, differentiability that for some reason students don't like, uh, you, what you can do naively is say, okay, I'm going to take the derivative of both sides so this is going to work for x strictly negative, and this is going to work for x strictly positive. I, ca I cannot do it for x equals 0, okay? because I don't know whether it's differential at 0 at this point. But certainly I can do this. And then what I'm going to say is, well, I'm going to look at the limit of g prime of x as x goes to 0. What's this? Well, from the left it's zero, from the right it's zero. You, you should take a sequence and do the usual thing, but intuitively it's clear that you're going to find zero if you do that. So the naive student says, well, then g prime of zero is zero. And for once the student is right. Yes, it's, it is a true theorem. You can do that. However, there is something to prove, okay? 
Do we agree that there is something to prove? Well, the only thing you are doing here is showing that your G prime has a limit at zero. Why should your G prime, why should this limit be equal to the derivative of your function? That's not trivial, not to me at least. Okay, you need to prove that, and that's what the problem is about. Now, what's wrong, and many people think is right, is the converse. It's not because I don't have a limit that it means that my function is not differentiable. So it's not such a great method because, I mean, if you find a limit, you are fine. If you don't find a limit, then you have to go back to the definition. Okay? So let's prove it. So A, we have, so we know that Xn is in I, okay, and it's never equal to A, then, okay. So what we're going to say here is the following. Mm. Yeah, so uh, a hypothesis is, mi is missing here. I should have said that G is continuous also. Otherwise, um, I'm going to be in trouble to apply the mean value theorem. Okay? So this is, mi this is missing. We should say that G is continuous on I. Now, uh, Xn belongs to A, and we don't know which, whether Xn is less than A or bigger than A, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what we have is that G is continuous in on Xn A or Axn, depending which one is bigger, okay? And G is differentiable on xn a or a xn because I know it may not be differentiable at a but it's differentiable everywhere else therefore if I exclude a I'm fine and now what I'm going to say is that the Lagrange mean value theorem applies and there exists a cn between xn and a such that um, so uh, g of xn minus g of a is equal to g prime of cn times xn minus a. Now, I call this CCN because it obviously depends on XN, and XN depends on N. So it's a better notation. You could call it C, but then you need to remember that it's a C which is moving around when your XN is. So better idea to just call it uh, CN, so that you have a sequence now. Okay, so do you see the application of a mean value theorem? You just check continuity on the closed bounded interval, differentiability on the open interval, you can apply it. Prove that G is differentiable at A. So we are going to use this, obviously. And what we're going to say is the following, that Cn is between A and Xn, or uh, Xn and A. I mean, it's, it's in between Xn and A. And Xn converges to A. That's, that's how we picked our, our A. Therefore, our CN needs to converge to A as N goes to infinity. Okay? Because CN is between A and XN, and XN is converging to A, you don't have much room. I mean, your CN needs to go to 
uh, to A. That's that's not uh, that's the only possibility. <laughs> So what can I say about the G prime of Cn? What happens to G prime of Cn? Yes? It must converge to Ga because it's a function. Well, uh, you don't know that G prime is continuous. What you are told is that G prime has a limit as X approaches A. And that limit is but called L. G prime is still a function, and the function uh, of you know, f of x of n converges to f of a Only if f is continuous. That's the definition of being continuous at a. Okay? So this converges to L because it's a hypothesis. Right? The hypothesis is g prime of x has a limit which is L. So if cn goes to a, g prime of cn must converge to L. Well, this tells you then that uh, because g prime of cn is also g of xn minus g of a over xn minus a, this converges to L. Okay, because this sequence is the same as this one. So they converge to the same limit, of course. <coughs> but this gives you differentiability. <coughs> right? You are doing the ratio, the usual ratio to show differentiability. So g is differentiable at a and G prime of A is L. So we proved that yes, if your G prime has a limit, then it implies differentiability. But you see that you need to do something. Okay? It's not uh, completely trivial. Say that again. Why, why is G different for A? So, this has a limit, right? And the limit is L. But this also is the definition of differentiability. Okay? So because when, when this xn goes to a, I find that I always have a limit and the limit is L, it means that my function is differentiable. So part C is about the converse. The converse is not true. And the converse is not true, simply take, well, simply. It's, it's always the same function. That's why I say simply. But uh, it's really not that easy to guess if you don't know it. Take for G this function. Okay, this is a very good function to find counterexamples in terms of differentiability, continuity, uh, things like that. So you have a function which is well defined everywhere because for x different from 0, this is well defined, and at 0, it's 0. Now, if x is different from 0, uh, or let's let's take a different from zero, then g is differentiable at a. Why is that? How can I justify that if I pick an a outside zero, I have a differentiable function? Since you have a nice function. I have a nice function because. I'm composing sinus with 1 over x, they are both differentiable, and then I'm multiplying by x squared. The whole thing is differential. Yeah. Okay? So locally, because I need to be close to a, I need to avoid 0, because at 0 I have troubles. Uh, locally, my function, so g, is. What is it? It's uh, x. So it's a polynomial times sinus. Well, I'm moving on. Just right. <coughs> Where p of x is x squared and 
i of x is 1 over x. So g is differentiable as a, uh, for, I mean, as a consequence of operations on differentiable functions. Okay. Now, what's g prime of x when x is different from 0? Well, we can use uh, the algebra of uh, derivatives. So what do we have? We have a product. So we use the product rule. x squared times the derivative of sine of 1 over x. There we need to use the chain rule plus 2x sine of 1 over x. Okay, so we are using the product rule and the chain rule to get this. So this is minus cosine of 1 over x plus 2x sine of 1 over x. Now what happens to g prime of x as x goes to 0? Well, what happens to this part? It, goes to zero. it must go to zero because you have that 2x sinus 1 over x is less than 2 times x. Sinus is less than 1. Okay, so you get rid of the whole thing, sinus of 1 over x, by doing that. And you, you have a nice uh, continuous function on this side. And this is bigger than 0. So this is going to 0, and this is going to 0. So that's not a problem. Now, what happens to cosine 1 over x? Yeah, it's going to be wild okay, as you approach 0. And therefore, you have no limit. How do you prove that? Well, you can. So that's something that you were confused about in the last test, and I hope you won't be in the final which is when I'm trying to show that something is not continuous or not differentiable, I pick my favorite sequence to show that, okay? I pick a sequence that will give me the least amount of work to show that I have either two different limits or no limits at all. But when I'm trying to show continuity, I cannot do that. I must take a generic sequence going to the point. Okay, do we agree on that? Okay, I take xn going to a. I cannot say, well, I'm going to take a plus 1 over n, because that won't work. I need to prove it for every possible sequence. So in this case, because I'm, I'm trying to find a counterexample, I'm going to pick xn that makes cosines of 1 over xn nice to compute. One way to do that is to, to take, uh, well, 2n pi plus pi over 2 because it's a periodic function, of course, with period 2 and pi, 2 pi. So this goes to 0. That's, that's uh, necessary, of course. We always need to take something going to the point we're interested in. So xn goes to 0. And when we do cosinus of uh, 1 over xn, we see that it's cosinus of 2 and pi plus pi over 2. And that's cosinus of pi over 2. That's a constant, and that's a 0. So this sequence goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So we get one limit. Now we need another limit to show that the limit does not exist. So we are going to take yn to be 1 over 2n pi. Okay? And 1 over 2n pi goes to 0. And then cosinus of 1 over yn is this time cosinus of 2n pi. And cosinus of 2n pi is cosinus of 0, which is 1. So we have found two 
ways to go to zero that gives you two different values for your limit. The limit does not exist, okay? So, absolutely, yeah. So cosinus of one over x has no limit as n goes to as x goes to zero. Now, um, another question: What if I had shown that this has no limit and this has no limit? Would it be doubly no limit? I mean, even no more limit, or am I in trouble? I think you're in trouble. I'm in trouble because no limit minus no limit is maybe a limit. Okay, so I was lucky that this thing here has a limit. Okay, so that's okay. That proves it because this has no limit. The whole thing has no limit. Are we going to be uh, similarly lucky on the test? I hope for you. <laughs> No, this, this is a little bit, uh, a little bit more difficult, and you should be frightened by that. By that, but since I'm talking about this result, I wanted to, uh, to show you the whole uh, thing. But it's not like the typical test question. So, uh, where are we? We are trying to find a counterexample to show that it may be the case that g prime of x has no limit, which is what's here, but g is still differentiable. Okay, so that's the last step we need in this counterexample, is to show that g is actually differentiable at zero. Okay, so we, sh we have shown that g prime of x has no limit. That's done. Now, let's show that g is actually differentiable at zero. Well, that's quite easy, actually, because what we're going to do is simply take hn goes to 0, hn different from 0, and we're going to do g of 0 plus hn minus g of 0 over hn. So we end up g of 0 is 0, g of hn over hn. So g of hn is uh, hn square sinus of 1 over n over hn. And we get that g of 0 plus hn minus g of 0 over hn is less than where is equal to So the hn cancel, I'm left with an hn up here, sinus, uh, it's 1 over hn here. Sinus 1 over hn. So that's less than hn. Same thing, sinus is less than 1. Okay. So this is positive and goes to 0. And this goes to 0 by the way we picked out our hn. Therefore, g is differentiable and g prime of 0 is 0. Okay, so our counterexample is complete. G prime of 0 has no limit as it approaches 0. G prime of x has no limit as, uh, as, uh, as it approaches 0, absolutely. That has an answer when it gets there. Sort of. Correct. I, I Correct. It's it's, it's not a continuous. It's not a continuous function. But this is what it is. Okay. You have it's zero at zero, but as I, you approach zero, it's it's going wide around it. Yeah. Okay. That's the problem. Okay. Number six. So what can I say about a Riemann integrable function? Is it a continuous function? Not necessarily. Okay, integrable function is less. 
okay? You may have discontinuities. But I still can say something. What can I say? What, what type of nice property an integrable function has? Besides being integrable. It's bounded. Okay, an integrable function is necessarily bounded. That's in our definition. Okay, so we know that we have a bounded function. Right, so that's what we're going to say. There exists a k, so that f of x is less than k for all x in AB. It's a bounded function. Okay, and now uh, we want to prove that inequality. Well, if x is less than y, let's say, then we want to examine f of x minus f of y. Uh, that's ax f minus ay f. And we do the just the, the addition property here to get so the a, a x cancel and we end up with minus uh, x y f. So f of x minus f of y is this thing. And up to this point, I have not really used that x is less than y. You can do that for any x and y you want. Now, let's take absolute values. Equal to absolute value. So I can get rid of a minus sign. Okay, The absolute value of minus 2 or 2 is the same thing. So we get rid of the minus and f here. And then this is less than this. So, do I need to know that x is less than y for this inequality to work? I do. Okay, be careful. Otherwise, you get a negative number here. Okay, if you're integrating a positive function from uh, 2 to 1, you are going to get a negative answer. Because the answer from 1 to 2 is positive, and from 2 to 1, it's the opposite. So here, to get inequalities, you need to know what the relation is between your two bounds. To get equalities, you don't. Okay, you just do it uh, algebra-wise. But when you come to these inequalities, you do need to know that x is less than y. And now this is less than... Do we necessarily know that in the question? No, you don't. That's the subcase, x less than 1. And then we'll do y bigger than x. So f is less than k. And again, to do that, and maybe I should just, OK, so let's say that f is less than k. And now we can integrate this. And that's k times y minus x. Again, for this inequality to work, I need to know that x is less than 1. So we get k, y minus x. Now we redo exactly the same thing. <coughs> for the other case, which would be x bigger than y. If we have x bigger than y, what happens? f of x minus f of y is going to be this. And this time we go from y to x. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, we uh, do f of x minus f of y less than this, which is less than f x. Uh, it was y x, wasn't it? Yeah. And that's because this time I know that y is less than x. Now f less than k, integral from y to x of f, which is k times x minus 1. Do we need to know that it's a positive uh, function? No. No, that's true for any f. So the conclusion of that is that in, if x is less than y, you get y minus x. And if x is bigger than y, you get x minus y. So you always get absolute value of x minus y. That's what you get. Okay, you, you put the two together now. And you say, well, then f of x minus f of y is really less than k x minus y for all x and y. And we get our inequality. OK, show that f is continuous. Uh, no, uh, we, we did that question already in homework. Once, once we have this property, it's easy to see continuity. Uh, assume that a, so where are we? So let c belong to a, b. Uh, take x and going to c. Then if you do f of xn minus f of c times uh, this is less than k times xn minus c, this is positive. So this goes to 0, and this goes to 0. Therefore, f of xn minus f of c goes to 0. Actually, you can, by using this inequality, you can show uniform continuity. Okay, you can pick for every epsilon, you can find a delta that will work uniformly in your interval. Okay? Uniform continuity will not be in the final anyway. But uh, just uh, to point this out, you, because this is a stronger property, then uh, just continue it. You can also use the epsilon proof to do that. Uh, I think we did it uh, both ways when we talked about this in the homework. So f of xn converges to f of c, which tells us that f is continuous at c. OK, so the point here is that you start with a function which is integrable, which may be quite, not quite, but a little irregular, let's say. And by doing capital F, by doing this operation on, on lowercase f, you get a continuous function. Okay, so that's uh, what uh, the main teaching of this is. So let's take for f. Uh, something which is not continuous, like 1 here and then 0 here. Okay. So this is our function f. It has a discontinuity at 0, let's say. Then in the last homework, we proved that, so let's take x between 0 and 1. We proved that this is 0. Remember, we needed to use the 
the Darbu sums, and we showed that uh, the lower Darbu sum was always zero, and the upper Darbu sum was one over n if you are dividing your interval here in n pieces. So by squeezing it, we show that this integral is always zero. But that's our capital F of x. So f is identically zero and is therefore continuous on zero one. We got rid of the discontinuity by doing this operation. And any, I mean, that's, uh, that happens all the time in, in probability you have functions, step functions like that, and then you take the integral because it, it, it has some significance in probability to take the integral of your density function. You get uh, the distribution function. And you get nice uh, continuous function. Like this, this thing would, be, would change slope, but would be continuous. You get rid of your discontinuity when you take the integral. Questions? So look at uh, the two tests. Uh, look at the uh, integration homeworks. So you have about one fourth of the final will be on integration, mainly inequalities, not so much the boost sums, but more, you know, how do I, do I get inequalities with integrals? Uh, a little bit uh, things of this time that we have been doing here. Um, what else? Know your terms, know the hypothesis, be able to state the hypothesis and the conclusion properly. Questions, comments? Okay. So, we need to thank our cameraman. <laughs> so I forgive you for having to watch myself.